Hello, everyone. This is Sirius Trivia, and today I have a very special episode of our Let's Talk Lore series, meant to answer a comment I got last week, asking me what did people of the Three Kingdoms period eat. This is a great question, as oftentimes the study of history tend to focus on major events like war, and minor everyday life events like eating ends up taking a back seat. Well, today we're just going to talk about food during the Three Kingdoms period. Which really is a discussion about food during the Han Dynasty, as customs during the Three Kingdoms period remain largely the same. Now, the first thing you have to understand about Chinese culture is that it is very much a food culture, which is evident from even Han court documents stating "Wang Zhe Yi Min Wei Tian," or "Min Yi Shi Wei Tian," which translates to "For the Emperor." His subjects are of the utmost importance, and for his subjects, food is of the utmost importance. In addition to court documents, even simple everyday greetings, such as "trilama," meaning "Have you eaten?" is still used today as the Chinese equivalent of "How are you doing?" And because of the elevated status of food in Chinese culture. Cooking techniques and the breadth of ingredients became as much of a science as an art form, even back in the days of the Han Dynasty. But before we dive into cooking, we have to discuss the raw ingredients, as the most essential discussion of food in the past is the awareness of the ingredients that they didn't have. As today, we tend to live in a global society. Where we take non-seasonal and non-local food for granted, whereas the scope of cultural exchange across the globe was much more limited during the Han Dynasty in the second century. First off, New World ingredients like corn, tomato, potato, and chili pepper were definitely not part of the Han diet, as the coarse starch during the Han Dynasty were foxtail millet. Wheat, rice, soybeans, and white millet, which are collectively known in Chinese as wu gu or the five grains. Of the five, the first three were the most common, with the foxtail millet being the predominant crop in the northern parts of the country. Now you have to remember during this period, the north-south divide is the Huai River, which means that most of the south were largely undeveloped. And unsettled, and that meant 80 percent of the population lived in the north. So the millet was their main grain. Wheat was also starting to become a main crop countrywide as milling technologies allowed for the production of flour, and rice was only a chief crop in the south. While soybeans and white millets were beginning to go out of favor, and oftentimes used largely for animal consumption. Or for additional processing, such as the production of soy sauce, bean paste, and tofu, which was invented during the Han Dynasty. Now, from Han documentation, we also have a good idea of how much grain was consumed per person. As in a document debating the merits of raising pigs, it was said that the average adult male was expected to consume 15 dou. Of millets per half month, or roughly one dou a day. Now, dou as a unit converts to about 6.25 kilograms today, which sounds like a lot of grain for daily consumption. But you have to understand that for the large majority of the Han population back then, meat was simply a luxury that was only ever available during major holidays like Chinese New Year's. As that same 15 dou of millet, which could feed the adult male for half a month, is also the same amount of grain required to feed one pig for a day, and thus, with the limited agricultural technologies of the time and thus limited production, human consumption had to come first. As meat from domesticated animals were eaten by only the wealthy and the elderly in the families who could afford it. Now, speaking of domesticated animals. The six main animals domesticated on a large scale during the Han Dynasty were horses, cows, pigs, dogs, sheep, and chicken, which were collectively known as the Liu Chu in Chinese. Of these six, 
Horses were almost never eaten, as they were mainly used for transportation and war. Cows were also off limits, as it was the main labor for farming, as all cows were registered property by the government, and personal consumption was a capital offense. And only when a cow was deemed too old or weak by the government, that it would be slaughtered and thus consumed. Pigs, on the other hand, was raised for meat, but it was also a useful animal to keep for manure production, which can be turned into fertilizers for the field. Sheep provided wool for clothing and milk, as sheep and goat milk were the main dairy product consumed by the Hun. Chicken hatched eggs and provided meat, and dogs guarded the house, but was also the main meat animal of the time, as compared to the other five domesticated animals, it was the least productive. Of course, non-domesticated meat sources were also consumed as people ate off the land whenever possible. So everything from fish in the rivers to wild games in the forests made its way to the dinner table. Wild games always get a bit crazy in China, as everything from bears to leopards were hunted and cooked as delicacies, especially with the rarity of meat consumption, making it a lucrative business for hunters and butchers, even though medicinal connections between these delicacies wouldn't even be a thing until the Song Dynasty. So now that we have covered grains and meat, we also need to talk about vegetables, which featured mainly those native to China, such as chives, bok choy, daikon radish, Chinese broccoli or gailan, napa cabbage, lotus roots, scallions, garlic, ginger, and certain type of gourds and melons, and these were all readily available in their proper seasons. Foreign vegetables from the Silk Road did start to make appearance in later periods of the Han Dynasty, such as cucumbers, loofah gourds, and carrots. This was also the same for fruits, as the Silk Road brought in grapes and pomegranates, while native fruits such as peach, plumes, and pears were passed out in the exchange. While the spice trade would be rather limited during this period, the arrival of sesame seeds during this period had a major impact on Chinese cuisine, especially as it became a main flavoring agent in a lot of grain dishes, either in the form of garnish or sauce. And now that you have a good idea about the raw ingredients, let's talk about how they were cooked and consumed. So for the vast majority of the people, two meals a day was the standard. Wealthy families might eat three times a day, while the emperor was recorded to eat four times. Now for a typical family, your meal would be largely grains, but you did have a lot of options and choices in terms of how you cooked it and consumed it. Millets are cooked very similar to the way we treat rice today, as it can be made into a watery congee, where you can then add vegetables in, or it can be eaten in a bowl like rice, along with dishes of vegetables that are boiled, steamed, or stir-fried. Or you had the choice to mill down the grain and get flour to make a variety of bread that can be stored more easily and for longer periods of time, or steamed for immediate consumption, similar to steamed buns featured as the only food source in Dynasty Warrior games. Flour can also be mixed with oil and honey to make sweets, shaped into noodles, to make soup noodles, and made into batters for crepes, as cooking techniques during the Han were already quite advanced. Hot pot was a very popular thing, and for those lucky enough to eat meat, skewers for kebabs were the main way to cook meat in addition to stews, stir fries, smoked or preserved meats, and jerkies. Now for the emperor, Food was managed by a team of 3,000 courtiers, governed by seven officials who were in charge of everything from sourcing and growing ingredients, cooking and serving the four daily meals, and the palace maintained a farm that had a greenhouse for off-season ingredients, maintained through fires that kept the rooms warm during winters, so that the emperor could continue to enjoy things like scallions and spring chive. Conversely, 
Ice was chopped up in large blocks and stored during the winter in deep cellars for summer consumption to help keep the emperor cool. Overall, this entire operation costed the Han 200 million a year, or roughly 550,000 a day, which was the market price for 84,000 kilograms of premium rice or 45,000 kilograms of meat. So in essence, the cost of feeding the emperor and the imperial family for a year could end up feeding roughly 20,000 above average households for the same period. And on the opposite end of the spectrum, armies on the march typically consume grains either in the form of a big pot of vegetable kanji or in the form of dried goods, whether that is a non-shaped bread or sun-dried rice where the rice is cooked, crispy bottom, and then left out in a dry air with the sun until it's hardened, and then you can break it up, rehydrate it to eat it, or just eat it straight up. But one advantage for soldiers is that they often had access to meat, as jerky and smoke and preserved meat were often provided, and sometimes injured horses or looted livestock were slaughtered for feast as well. Though in tough times, cannibalism was still a common occurrence as slave laborers and enemy captives were often used as meat to pass through tough times just to bring light to the fact that at the end of the day, food is fundamentally consumed to ensure our survival and with the limited capacity for production during the Han Dynasty, food was still a scarce resource as one of the first restrictions you will see placed during times of war in the Three Kingdoms period is the ban on alcohol production as it was seen as a waste of precious grains needed for the army and the horses. But thankfully, we live in better times today where food waste is more of a problem than food scarcity, although there are still large areas of the world where people still have daily struggles with hunger. So hopefully this video has shed some light into food consumed during the Han and Three Kingdoms period. And if you have any similar questions, feel free to leave a comment below. Who knows? Maybe next time I'll be making a video answering your question. So until then, bye.